Welcome to another morning with Waking with the Word. We're in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 21, all the way to verse 30. Here we go. An inheritance claimed too soon will not be blessed at the end. Do not say, I'll pay you back for this wrong. Wait for the Lord and he will avenge you. The Lord detests differing weights, and dishonest scales do not please him. A person's steps are directed by the Lord. How then can anyone understand their own way? It is a trap to dedicate something rashly, and only later to consider one's vows. A wise king winnows out the wicked. He drives the threshing wheel over them. The human spirit is the lamp of the Lord that sheds light on one's inmost being. Love and faithfulness keep a king safe. Through love his throne is made secure. The glory of young men is their strength. Grey hair is the splendour of the old. Blows and wounds scrub away evil, and beatings purge the innermost being. Okay, we're going a little bit deep today, but bear with me and I hope you will understand. I want to jump straight in at verse 27. The human spirit is the lamp of the Lord that sheds light on one's innermost being. Now, a lot of translations say that searches the belly. The belly was a word used for the innermost being. And it is not a coincidence that we also have a scripture in the New Testament where Jesus says, out of your belly, will come rivers of living water. Very often when the Lord leads us, it can be an actual feeling near and around inside our belly. Because the Holy Spirit comes to reside within our being, within our bodies, just like our own spirits. But this verse clearly says the human spirit. It doesn't say the spirit of God leads us, which is why this verse is tremendously different, I guess, from other verses where we hear of the Holy Spirit leading us. No, this verse says that the human spirit is the lamp of the Lord. In the Hebrew, it says the spirit of man, Adam, the spirit of Adam. And the word spirit means breathe. It means breathing thing. It means inspiration. It means divine inspiration. It means intellect. It means wind. But the most important thing for us to remember is that it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1 that the body returns to the ground from which it came and the spirit returns to the Lord from which it came. If we look in Genesis, it says that the Lord breathed into Adam and he became a living being. So God breathed the spirit into Adam, his own spirit. The spirit is the part of us that makes our body breathe. You know, when your spirit leaves your body, your body stops breathing. This is exactly what happened when Jesus died on the cross. Into your hands I commit my spirit, is what he said, and his spirit left his body, and his body died. Now we know that we're commanded and we're exhorted to be led by the Holy Spirit. So why is this verse saying that the human spirit is a candle? Well, it says it's the candle of the Lord because it came from God. It was given by God and it returns back to God. I would say that our spirit is supposed to be our conscience. It comes from the divine one who made heaven and earth, who wrote and made all of the commandments and who knows exactly how he desires each human being to live. But what happens is for several different reasons in life, we can be cut off from our spirit. If you take a child and you teach it your rules, your way, the way you want things done, what it should be and shouldn't be you're going to break that little child's spirit. You're actually going to stop that child being able to recognize its own wants, its own feelings and its own desires. Our job as parents is not to stop our children knowing what they want, 
but to teach our children self-restraint, although they have desires, to tell our children and show our children that not every desire is profitable for them. We do not stop them desiring, nor do we teach them their desire is wrong and evil and they shouldn't have them and that dad and mum or whoever carer you are always knows best and that the child knows nothing because that child will grow up and not know what it feels in any situation. They will grow up and they will be a yes no person who goes along with everything everyone else says and wants to appease other people and please other people because you have taught them to please their parents. Children should not be brought up to please their parents, nor should they be brought up to please themselves, but they should be brought up to want to please God by living the life that they have been given to live in the best way possible for them. They are individuals, they are not part of you. Now many parents take on their children as part of themselves and they teach their children to always think what would dad say, what would mum say, but dad and mum are not perfect. And dad and mum may have had many years on this earth to find out what dad and mum want and what dad and mum think. But your job is to train that child to find out what it thinks and what it truly wants and the best way to treat others and to go about getting a life that was given to them. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have life in all its fullness. But the word there, as I've often said, is Zoe life, the life of God. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, our human spirits get what is called quickened by the Holy Spirit. We communicate with the Holy Spirit as we were meant to in the beginning. God is spirit. And when he came down and he walked with Adam, he came in spirit. At the very beginning, it says the spirit of God was brooding over the waters. The word brooding actually means to tremble with excitement. God was excited about what he was going to do. And I believe he was excited for every single human being that was going to be created on this planet. Because he had an aim for them. He had a good life for them. God is good. He does nothing, nothing in evil or wickedness. If he creates something, it's good. And he was excited about the good that he was going to create. God is love. And so if he creates anything, he does it in love. And he was excited about how much he was going to love seeing his creation succeed and prosper. And so he breathed spirit. He breathed life into Adam. And he would come into the garden and communicate with Adam and teach Adam and guide Adam. But Adam was a life in itself. And that is like us. The human spirit is a life in itself. And the human spirit can have communication, intimate contact, connection, unity with the spirit of God, the same as Adam had. Why? Because Jesus came and he died and rose again and he refilled that body that was full of death and said, I can bring humanity back into a living relationship with the Holy Spirit. And so through the death of Christ, we gain an inheritance and that inheritance is the Holy Spirit. A life lived once again with God in our spirit. But the spirit came from God. And so it is meant to be a lamp. And it's the lamp of the Lord. It's the lamp that God has given us to tell us right from wrong. Another way of stopping someone's conscience is to leave them with no correction. If you take a child and you don't teach it right from wrong, well, it gets to do certain things over and over again. It sees no reason why it shouldn't do them. And even though the spirit might know it's wrong, the mind and the emotions and the will of that person have no idea it's wrong. 
because they're cut off from the Spirit. Until we know the Lord, we don't really know much about the spiritual realm. Many of us have never thought about it, or perhaps we've been involved in the spiritual realm in another way, not in a godly way. But for many people, they walk around on what they see and what they feel and what they can touch is all that is real. But coming into fellowship with the Holy Spirit quickens, it wakes up our spirit. It makes us aware that there's more there than just the physical. There's another part of me that I maybe never even realized was there. Now, sometimes the spirit can whisper through, like when you get intuition, that's your spirit telling you things that physically your mind could never know, that physically your emotions could never feel, and that physically your desires could never want. But something, just something, is telling you something that's supernatural, that you would never know unless you had that intuition. That's your spirit. And when we come to know the Lord, he doesn't want us just to get to know him. Do you know he wants you to get to know yourself? He wants you to find yourself by going on a journey with him. You don't have to go to the other side of the world to find yourself because you are within yourself and God has breathed you into yourself and the Holy Spirit can come and wake you up. He can wake you up so that you know yourself and you know your real desires and your real thoughts and your real feelings and who you really are because he breathed you into yourself. God wants us to be in touch with our human spirits and the Holy Spirit. He wants us to be able to hear what both are saying so that we know who we are and we know who he is and so that we can guide direct and live our lives in such a way that is going to be profitable for us that is going to be within his will because he is the king of kings the lord of glory and he loves us he loves us and he doesn't want to have to judge us guilty for anything when he's given a way of redemption he's given a way out of those things that lead us into sin and ultimately lead us into death. And the next part of the verse says that it sheds light on one's innermost being. And the original translation is that it's a candle searching the belly. Now in the Hebrew, this word for search can mean to diligently search or to examine. Our spirit is supposed to examine our innermost being. And the word innermost being is actually the word for heart. It's the word for your inward parts. In fact, it actually means inner chamber or bedroom, which is interesting to me because Jesus said, go into your closet. And again, it's a similar word. Go in to your secret room, but it actually can mean inner being, inner parts. So your spirit that is given by God should be a light to you and it should examine all of your inner being, your inner thoughts, your inner feelings, your inner motives, your inner desires, because it comes from God. It's the part of you that can communicate with God. That's the part that meets with him. Your mind makes sense of it. Your heart may feel it and your desires may be changed or convinced by it. The word conviction means to be convinced. You may be convinced that a certain desire is not right before God. It's not good before God. It's not what God wants. Or you may be persuaded that it is good. And the word persuasion is the word that we have translated faith from. So it, you may have faith, you may be persuaded on the inside that something is the will of God, but that persuasion and that conviction will come to you in your spirit. So in today's Christian world, we so very often are looking for signs. 
I've had this sign, so I think it's the will of God. And that sign, I think it's the will of God. And I'm going to lay a fleece because if I lay a fleece, God can tell me. And today I want to challenge you to stop looking at signs and stop laying those fleeces and start to ask God to wake up your spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul prayed in Ephesians 3 verse 14 that you would be strengthened with power in your inner man. And the thing that strengthens your spirit and the thing that gives it power is the Holy Spirit. The word power is used so many times in the New Testament and it means Holy Spirit. In fact, our word dynamite comes from the word that actually has been translated power. It's a dynamic power and it is the power of God. Do you not know the power that resides within you? Do you genuinely think you can have a quiet walk with the Lord inside? Definitely not. He's the God of the universe. He's going to come into your being and he's going to make some noise. This is why when the Holy Spirit falls and baptizes people, it's not just a quiet thing. And even if he comes in peace, he changes your life dramatically. Can you meet with the King of Kings, with the Lord of Glory without being changed? No. No, you can't. He will wake you up. And he will make you who you're meant to be. No more of this idea that when we become Christians, we become Bible carrying, cardigan wearing, tambourine tapping old men and women that wear Jesus sandals with socks in them and look ridiculous. That's not what my God does. My God shakes you up on the inside and gives you power to live your life on the outside. But here's the warning from this passage. 21 verse 21 says, an inheritance claimed too soon will not be blessed at the end. And then a little further down, we have this verse where it says, love and faithfulness keep a king safe. Through love, his throne is made secure. And verse 29, the glory of young men is their strength. Gray hair is the splendor of the old. I want to warn us. We come to know the Lord and we can be so enthusiastic. We come to know the Lord and we realise that our inheritance is the Holy Spirit. But we must walk with him. And it's a changing day in, day out. And when we're young, we have strength and we have power. But we may not have character. We may not have experience. We may not have full understanding because walking with the Lord is something that we must put work into every day of our lives if we want to grow in him. By nature now, we're more grounded than we are lifted. Now, let me explain what I mean. What we see, what we feel, what we hear is what seems real. And only when the Holy Spirit comes do we come in touch with the spiritual. But it's a being filled, being filled, being filled walk. And we have to be filled, be filled, be filled because we live on this earthly planet and we were cut off from the spiritual and Jesus has made our way back. But we must maintain it. We must want to walk with him every day. So spiritually, we are growing and living and not dying and not neglecting that part of ourselves. Because of the curse of sin, everything is spiraling to the point of death. It's withering and it's dying. But because of the gift of Christ, we can have that life giving power. New life in Jesus. New life where? In our spirits. Where do you get born again? You don't go back into your mother's womb, do you? No, nope. the Bible said that a man came to Jesus and he asked this very question. How can I be born again? I can't go back into my mother's womb. You get born again in your spirit. But you must live again in your spirit. Now, do not claim an inheritance too soon. As soon as we come to know the Lord, we want to do great things for him. We want to reach out. But pride can come on that ground. And also, if you 
make something of someone too soon, no matter what their giftings are, they can be puffed up. They can become proud because they have not learnt to walk with the Lord, to rely on the Lord. Verse 30 says, blows and wounds scrub away evil and beatings purge the innermost being. The word blows and wounds there, wounds, it actually means blueness in Hebrew. It means bruises. And as we live our lives, we get bruises, don't we? And as we learn to take those bruises to our Heavenly Father, and as we learn to listen to God, it purges the innermost being. It scrubs away that evil that is there because we've lived our lives without knowing him, without seeing him, without even acknowledging him. And that is the first thing we must repent of. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path or he will give you success. Or another translation says, he will make your path straight. It's a growing daily relationship where we learn to be led by him so that he can make our path straight. But we cannot get into positions of authority too soon. Because you know, your gift will take you where your character could never keep you. And God desires that you are in a place of authority only when he has been able to prepare you for it so you can sustain it and you don't look stupid and the ministry is not hindered. People see Christians in places of authority and they admire them and they almost see them as God and when they fall people turn away from God because they see you as a representation of him and you're not. We must never think we are. We're not Jesus with clothes.